What's up, everybody? Welcome to the premiere of SNY's second season of Mets Off Day Live. I'm your host, Chelsea Sherrod. We will have a mixture of guests and hosts with you to talk Mets on every off day the club has throughout the season. But joining me today are SNY Mets reporter Danny Abriano and former Mets pitcher turned podcaster, video gamer, content creator, jack of all media trades, Trevor May. Welcome to the show, guys. How you guys doing? Great. I'm great. Thanks for having me, yeah, thanks for having me on. Of course. Vibes are high right now with the Mets. So I'm excited that we're having this off day live today. Um, all right, let's start with around the diamond. The Mets started the year 0 and 5 and since then have gone 10 and 3, finishing a sweep with of the Pirates yesterday. In the words of Steve Cohen that he posted on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, he said, I would bet the team flight out to LA should be pretty enjoyable. So Trevor, starting with you, how do you feel about the team so far? Um, I, I think that the response to the beginning of the season is uh, just about as good as you can ask for. Um, yeah, didn't look too good, but uh, it's looking a lot better lately. So some guys have gotten hot, especially young guys like Beatty, how he's doing, and Alvarez continuing his success from last year. I think that's there's a lot to be excited about. So I, I'm excited about it. I've been uh, trying to catch as many of the games as I can lately, uh, and it's been fun to watch. Yeah, everyone was ready to kind of just call the season earlier on. So it's nice to see that turnaround, like you mentioned. Uh, Danny, give us one name of a person who has impressed you the most so far. Uh, I'm going to go with Drew Smith. Um, you know, just a, kind of a random one to throw out there, but he got the chance to close on Tuesday. Uh, would have been the third straight day for Edwin Diaz. He came in, um, was going right after hitters, dominant one, two, three inning. Um, and he's been great. Just part of a really, really nice start for the bullpen. Um, you know, Smith gets a little bit of flack um, at times. I think that's really not uh, fair to him. He's been really good with the Mets. Um, but yeah, Drew Smith for me. All right, Drew Smith. I like it. Uh, Trevor, as a former player, we all know that the seasons are full of highs and lows. It could be a roller coaster at times. So how was it playing in New York during the highs of the highs and the lows of the lows? Uh, it, it's, it can be testing at times for sure. Uh, it's hard enough separating the game from your, like, you know, getting away from the field and not thinking about it for a minute. And, uh, you know, it's, it's New York city. It's like, you, you can't really leave the city. Uh, um, it's, it's like that everywhere. So yeah, it was tough at times, but I, it, the highs make it all worth it. Um, you know, if you need energy, there's, there's, uh, there's abundant places to get it. Uh, those crowds have always been incredible and, uh, just some of the best uh, just baseball experiences. It's just such a history-rich place, and I, I just uh, I loved running out on on the city field. It was it was some of the best moments uh, that I'll always remember, and that's that's kind of uh, something that sets New York uh, apart. But especially City Field is is that energy that that is just everywhere all the time. Yeah, and speaking of City Field, let's talk about it a little bit more. The Mets have had two rainouts this year, which is why we're having our first episode right now so unfortunately we don't know what the mets did on their last off day but instead we can show you some of the new things at city field this year take a look but mets fan chris omar going here at city field showing you what's new at the ballpark the 2024 season Brand new assortment of good food, and trust me, this year it's good. And that's what's new here at City Field for the 2024 season, but I'm gonna go back in and have some more food. All right, big thank you to Michelle Margot and to our producers for putting that together. Whenever a new season comes around, I am most interested in the food. But Trevor, is there anything new that stands out to you about City Field? Uh, the donuts. I, I would have loved to have a couple of those donuts. Been been baking my own donuts lately, so I'm always down to try a new one, and those look real good. Oh, what kind of donuts are you baking? 
Oh, I do the old fashioned, like the sour cream donuts. I, I love them. Those and uh, maple bars have been my favorites. Okay. All right. I didn't know you were a baker. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I'm always uh... <laughs> something. So baking is what it is now. Uh, Danny, anything stick out to you? Uh, yeah, I've been out there a couple of times. Um, Chitty's cheesesteak, um, delicious, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I had the empanadas last time I was out there. Those were very good. Um, I have to say there's one item that's missing that was there last year. Jacob's Pickles had a fried chicken sandwich. It was a spicy fried chicken sandwich on a glazed donut, um, which was outrageous. And I had never eaten anything like that before. And I was a little bit um, on the fence about doing it. But I probably ate it 10 times last year. It's gone. So that's oh. sad. But I'm going to go on a more positive note to end this. The K Corner, um, the bar that's attached to the ballpark, they're doing $3 Coors Lights from the time they open until first pitch. Um, so that is a really good deal if you're up for some beverages before the game. So I'll leave it with that. Yeah, that's clutch. That's clutch. I had never had a burger or sandwich on a glazed donut before. That sounds really interesting. But the salty sweet thing could work, I guess. It's It sounds insane, right? Like I'm a big burger guy. So like Burgers <laughs> yeah. in New York, Mineta Tavern, Raul's. I know Trevor's a foodie, but like places like that, that's where I'm drawn to. So I was suspect at first, but it works and it doesn't fall apart. It's not, it's really not too heavy. Um, but yeah, if I, if I talk about it more, I'm just going to get upset. So it was very good. <laughs> so I'm baking donuts and fried chicken sandwiches are my favorite food. So you just, you just set me right there. Put them together. It's a, it's a Put them together. It's somewhere in the city. Yeah, you can, you can oh, still come get it. I got to figure it I got to find that place. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, today is April 18th, which is National Columnist Day. So in honor of that, we are actually going to take a look back, back at some of Danny's tweets during Trevor's time on the Mets. And Trevor, we're going to give you a chance to react. So this is back August 21st, 2022. Danny says Trevor May can no longer be used in the late innings until he proves he can get big outs. All right. The second one. This one is from September 20th, 2022. And this says, as I was saying earlier, Trevor May stuff is filthy, would help Mets fans if he made things a tad less interesting, but he's got the good. So we see a little turn here, Trevor. We're now hopping on the Trevor May bandwagon. And the last one from October 2nd, 2022. Obviously, Mets should have just started Trevor May. Uh, so Trevor, what do you think of this? And we were talking in our, our pre-show meeting. I was saying we have to get his reaction to Danny's tweets. So what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, in, in Danny's defense, those things were probably very true on those days. <laughs> and that, that's very much how uh, how baseball works. But it's funny. I've, I've seen that first one. Uh, I, believe it or not, I got tagged in it a few times because people loved watching me uh, react <laughs> <Not a shot. laughs> or hop in the conversation or self-deprecate or something. But uh, yeah, it's 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 one pretty much a hundred percent of the time valid criticism, but uh, you know, I'm glad that two of the three are positive. And uh, if you get two or three tweets positive about you when you're a player, that's a win. That's a big win. Danny, how are you feeling about this? Are, were you cringing at us reading? No, your I mean, how are you feeling over there? Could, <laughs> this, is, this is all, this is all public stuff. Um, not going to go back and delete stuff. I don't think the first one, like the negative one was really even that bad. You know, Trevor was going through a bit of a rough stretch. Um, you know, I'm, I was pretty much always on the Trevor, the Trevor bandwagon. Um, obviously dude had filthy stuff. Um, so yeah, he was going through a little bit of a rough patch there in 2022, but you know, overall his, his tenure as a Met was really, was really, really good. And the, the tweets reflect that for the most part. I actually love that we're doing this right now. Like this, I'm eating this up. I wish that everyone would do this because everyone loves to get behind, you know, like the the keyboards and say whatever they want to say. But let's just bring people together, talk it out, and look at us years healthy, later. Healthy discourse. This is really healthy exactly, stuff. Exactly. Exactly. This is what being a Mets fan, media member. This is this is what happens. Uh, Trevor, do you have a best moment with a media member as a player? Oh, that's a good one. Um, maybe. Actually, I'll be honest. My first, uh, my first outing with, as a Met uh, did not go very well. Uh, started really well as a strikeout, but then it like kind of devolved into you know, a blown save for the first a game of the year after a after a delay because of a COVID scare. So uh, <laughs> I had to go in front of the media on the first day, and that wasn't great. And uh, I think at first, like the first few questions were like trying to get me to take responsibility, and then when I did, I think that the 
the way the mood changed, it was really like, I don't know, it felt really easy to just be honest about it. And uh, I can't say that, that it was always like that. So I maybe that's a little more wholesome than <laughs> than uh, uh, you guys were expecting. But like, I just, uh, I, I was terrified. I'll be honest. You hear about New York media and you're like, okay, uh, you don't want to go get in front of everybody on the first day you do it. And, you know, just have to be like, you know, I don't, I was terrible. <laughs> I was terrible. And I'm, I'm, I don't feel good about it. And as soon as that happened, like, it was just, it was really productive kind of like this is right now. So uh, that's, that's something I <laughs> it sticks in my mind, uh, how, how we got off on the right, it felt like we got on the right foot, which is um, something that not everyone does. So uh, that, that, I think that was a good introduction to, to my, how I was going to navigate playing New York. Yeah, I don't think it gets much better than that, honestly, with New York media, being a member of the media. Uh, Danny, let's just talk about some of your uh, written work. Uh, you spoke to a newly named top 100 prospect, Christian Scott, which you can find on SNY.TV. What were some of the highlights of that conversation? Uh, you know, what, what stood out to me the most with Christian, um, his continued quest to get better. Uh, the guy is already legit. He's missing tons of bats, really been dominant so far in AAA. But he just wants to keep holding things. Um, he seemed incredibly confident. Uh, totally ready for what pitching in New York uh, entails, both on and off the field. Uh, I asked him who he watched growing up, who he emulates. And the main guy, he mentioned Max Scherzer, but the main guy he mentioned was Jose Fernandez. Who Anybody who watched Jose Fernandez pitch, this guy was electric. He was a show. Um, and what struck me about, about Christian was he wasn't really talking about Fernandez's stuff. Uh, he was talking about his confidence, his ability to really control the crowd, uh, get people going, um, electrify the crowd. So uh, it really seems this kid has the goods, uh, and I would be pretty surprised if he's not up here uh, relatively soon. Now, that could be a month from now, two months from now, but his time is coming. Okay. Uh, let's talk to, about pen pals. Let's go into that. Uh, the Mets this season have the best team ERA, 3.33 in the National League, led by Edwin Diaz. They also have the best bullpen ERA, 2.97. That's also leading the National League. Uh, Danny, starting with you, is there anyone from the bullpen stuff that you've liked this season? Uh, I mean, really, I've, I've kind of liked all of it. Uh, pretty much everyone who came into the season expected to be one of the guys who pitches in high leverage spots has been really, really good. Um, obviously, you see, you know, Reed Garrett has been uh, insane so far. And uh, so he's a guy that really sticks out to me. Um, you know, dominant relievers can come out of nowhere all the time. And we've seen David Stearns has a knack for building really good bullpens. So yeah, Garrett is the guy who's really stuck out the most. Um, and it hasn't been luck. You look at his baseball savant page, it lights up red. So he is, he is looking good and I see no reason why he can't keep it up. Yeah. Trevor, what do you make of this story of Reed Garrett, a guy who's bounced around, was claimed off waivers, struggled, and is now finding some success? Uh, I, I, those are my favorite stories. Um, guys just getting opportunities. Opportunities are hard to get come by and sometimes you just don't get a, don't get things don't come together at the right time and for him to have it kind of happen and then also the turnaround happening at the same time where he's seen as a big part of it and he is uh that's that's always a good thing to see and to be honest he surprised me i uh i didn't see this coming i, I saw a lot of experience in that bullpen and a lot of that has come to fruition i think with Ottavino throwing like he is and rayleigh and and drew smith and guys that i was like second to six to get type of play from him i mean it's i think it's you know, especially like la yesterday, uh, the the way that he he goes out and throws two innings, like it's that bridge guy, and you have a good bridge guy, you're, you're ten, and you get to your big boys um, smoothly, regularly. If he can fill that role and do it well, that's uh, that's something that that other teams are also paying attention to. So, like when you become a commodity, um, you get that opportunity finally. So it's great to see. I'm, I'm happy for him. Yeah, Danny, do you think that he can keep this up? Uh, again, I see no reason to think he cannot do it. Um, again, these guys sometimes come out of nowhere. He only had about 45 innings um, of experience before this season. So uh, he is an older guy relatively. Um, but again, uh, this happens all the time. Uh, David Stearns has found these guys a lot. And this is kind of what, what held the Mets back in recent seasons. They're going out, they're paying for relievers. They're not really developing their own guys or finding the diamonds in the rough. And I think that Garrett really can be one of those guys. Yeah, Trevor, I want to ask you a little bit about Edwin Diaz and his dip in velocity. In 2022, his fastball averaged 99.1 miles per hour, his slider 90.8. Now his slider is down to 89, his fastball 96.6 is the average. 
How do you feel about his dip in velocity? Are you concerned about that at all? Um, some of this is uh, going to be, I, I'm not concerned to start. Uh, some of this is just to do with the injury. I mean, you just don't know what 100% is or what normal is when you're down for that long. Um, it's it's kind of like Tommy John's the same way. It's just a, one of those long rehab processes. So, um, you know, you might see midsummer where you start to see him really being explosive again in those 98 to 100 numbers. Um, I mean, the fact that he's even – the 96.6 is still the average and he's still getting eights and nines from time to time is a good sign. He's, it's just a couple ticks down. And uh, so, and then it'll warm up. It's it's April and it's New York. Um, there, there's everyone's generally around the league. The velos just slightly down in the beginning of the year too, so you can f- count for that. But I think that you know it's a leg. It's a leg thing. It's one of those. It feels good, but you just don't know until you test it a bunch of times. Um, and he's the fact that he's as I think sharp um, in terms of command is actually really impressive. So he, you know, the fact that he's still doing it with with the down ticking velocity, he's going to get that velocity back. It's only going to go up for the rest of the year. If I were, if you, uh, if I needed to bet on it, I'd, I'd bet that it would happen. Yeah, really good insight there, uh, Danny. How would you evaluate David Stern's bullpen move so far? Uh, I mean, I think with the exception of Michael Tonk and Johan Ramirez, they've pretty much all panned out so far. Um, and you know, one thing that's really impressed me and been interesting with Stern's is his willingness to move on really quickly if, if something's not working out. Uh, they moved on from Tonkin, uh, DFA'd him, eventually traded him for cash considerations and got him back. So we saw that. Uh, Johan Ramirez, he also moved on from him. Um, but yeah, I mean, the majority of these guys have really looked good. Um, they look like they could be core pieces for uh, the entirety of the season. But again, um, his his willingness and ability to change things quickly if they're not working on uh, working out really quickly um, has, has stood out to me. Okay, I like that. Um, I think we do have a fan question coming in. Our producer, Sam, was just telling me. Okay, she actually just sent it to me. So one second, guys. Okay, the fan question is from Daniel Cassiano from YouTube. It says, will Pete Alonzo be a Met for life? I don't want to see Pete in a different uniform. Danny, we'll start with you. What do you think? I've always thought that he would be. Um, and I see no reason to change that right now. Uh, I know a lot of people are worried that he went into the season unsigned, but you know the Mets did this with Edwin Diaz, did it with Brandon Nimmo. Um, we've seen uh, Steve Cohen's willingness to spend and spend big, obviously. Uh, it seems that Pete wants to be here, um, unlike maybe some other guys who have left recently. Pete really seems to like New York, seems to dig it. Um, so, again, I think what's going to happen is similar to the Nimmo situation and Diaz. Season's going to play out. Pete's going to hit his 45, 50 bombs, and they're going to resign him. Um, I'm not I'm not concerned about it. All right, Trevor, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think the only hurdle, and there's only one, would be just the timing of economics. It's the only thing you can, you know, the only excuse you can have for not signing him. But I think both parties involved very, very much want uh, Pete Alonso to be a Met for life. He He does love it there. And uh, he he loves the fans, and he loves he just loves the life he's built, and so he does want to be there. And that I, anyone who's been around him for more than a minute knows that he is where he feels like he belongs. So um, that gives me hope that even if the economics don't line up, that Pete's one of those guys that would do his darndest to make it line up the best on his camp to make it work. He he really is one of those type of people. You know, I'm not gonna fully put words in his mouth, but. That wouldn't surprise me at all either. Where if people are scratching heads, like, "Wow, you you could have got more money," I think I think it's he's one of those guys who would do who would look at options like that in order to make it work. So, um, and he's just he's he's the type of hitter that you have to make sure you have. Uh, he's you know a forty plus home run guy is hard to come by. There's not going to be anyone else on the market, and everyone else can be chomping the bit to get a guy like him to put him in their lineup. So, I wouldn't count on. Uh, it being an easier situation when there's uh, competition. So hopefully a little bit of conversation happens towards the end of the year, I hope, um, so that they can get a little head start. But uh, I, I think he will end up being in New York a long time. Long yeah, time. it just means that much more when you have a guy that's just passionate about playing for an organization. So hopefully they can figure something out there. Um, all right, let's take a look at the division. The Mets are now half game back of the Phillies and two and a half back from the Braves. Spencer Strider out for the season after having surgery to repair his UCL. Trevor, you said on your new podcast, Mayday, you both used the same doctor. So 
Trevor, starting with you, what impact does this have on the Braves and what's up with the pitchers going down so early this season? Uh, it's, it, it's a big blow. Um, you know, you, you never want to lose your, your ace. He was very highly touted and people are very excited about him. A lot of people's favorites with Cy Young this year. So it's very disappointing in that, in that side for fans, but for the Braves, um, they're fortunate that they have uh, a couple other guys who have a lot of experience taking over that number one role in a, in a rotation. And that's, you know, if, if a team were to lose a guy like Strider, uh, they're one of the better position teams to do it. Unfortunately, the backside of their, their rotation isn't, uh, isn't, they're not tons of depth there. So that that's where the struggles are going to come in. But Chris Sale and Max Fried are going to have to take, take the reins a little bit more. And that's something that they just don't, we would rather not have to do. So it's, it's a big gap. It, it definitely brings the teams in that division, I think, a, a little bit closer um, in terms of like things that can, the margin for error. Um, you know, the, the Braves are a couple injuries away from being a, in a little bit of trouble and possibly in not being right there in that pack where everyone's, kind of fighting for first and and that that uh it's not a place we want to be but if you're a Mets fan um you know this is this is you can we can get sneak some more wins in and go go down and do what you did to them in their place a couple more times this year and and we're we're having quite an interesting conversation uh come August and September so um yeah it's it's tough but and it's going to be a long comeback like I said uh Dr. Meister usually has a pretty long uh recovery time as well which works really really well but it, it once you get that packet given your calendar it's not the most exciting thing to look at so um but he does great work so i i wouldn't uh he i wouldn't i bet you strider comes back strong as ever but next year unfortunately yeah trevor quick follow-up one what impact if any does the pitch clock have on this i know you kind of went in depth about that a little bit in your recent podcast episode I think that varies from guy to guy. I think that there's certain guys who um, who need that recharge time more than others, uh, both mentally and physically. But I, one thing that I noticed through conversations with with guys too is uh, they didn't realize how much they were that that their breaks were actually affecting them physically, and they thought it was mostly mental. But in reality, they needed to recharge because they were using a lot of energy between pitches. Um, some guys say that it was really, really hard to do at first and their arm was getting tired much faster. And then some guys weren't bothered by it at all. So to say, I, I think there is definitely an effect. Um, I think we're just, there's a little bit of bad luck, but bad timing. A lot of guys going down at the same time. Everyone throws harder. Everyone spins it harder. Uh, even if you're trying to throw a better breaking ball, you're still putting more effort in to get it to move farther. So it's the same kind of effect. And uh, all of those things have an effect. I, I, there was even rumbles back when, the sticky stuff uh, crackdown happened. And there's a few guys who were like, yeah, I use it. And now I have to grip the ball twice as hard and I'm going to hurt myself. And uh, Tyler Glass now a, has a famous example of saying, I think that that's what hurt me. And he got Tommy John. Um, and it was just like the abruptness of it. Yeah, obviously we don't want anyone using uh, sticky stuff, but like baseball such a weird sport and where you use muscles that you don't even know you use and then uh, you don't use other ones and then suddenly you change something and then you're using st it, stuff changes and you have no idea um and before you know it, you're hurt so all of those things i think have have an effect um it's just a matter of like which one is affecting things the most and what what's going on at the time so um i i think that the conversation is a little funky because i don't think there's any way to separate these things i think they're just all connected yeah, more of an effect than the average fan or, or viewer thinks that it has. Uh, Danny, anything you've noticed around the NL East that makes you hopeful that the Mets are in good shape so far? Um, I kind of always thought they were in solid shape. I mean, you know, like, like Trevor said, the, the Braves are weaker without Strider. Um, the rotation is definitely less imposing without him. I still think they're just an offensive powerhouse. They're going to win the division. Um, and then the Phillies are really good. Um, but the thing is, the Mets don't have to overtake either of those teams this season to make the playoffs and then to make noise if they get there. So, you know, this is kind of what I expected. I expected the Braves in first, the Phillies in second, the Mets in third. Um, I know that there were some people who thought the Mets were, you know, quote unquote, taking a step back this season. And maybe, maybe they are, if you're looking at the expectations relative to last season, but look what happened last year. And again, Stearns is a skilled executive. He's put together a really solid roster and, most of the projection systems entering the season had the Mets as a borderline wildcard team. I think they're probably a little bit better than that. Um, and they've shown that over the last two weeks. 
right. I appreciate the optimism, Danny. Thank you. Uh, all right. It is time now for Viral Moment. Let's bring in Matt Spenley, SNY social media guru, to talk about this week's Viral Moment. What's up, Matt? What's up, guys? Uh, we've been talking a lot about the Mets. What's gone right? What's gone right in the field for them? How the bullpen's gone? But we failed to mention the number one reason why they're playing better baseball. And it's our pal, Max, the Mets fan that has been shown on our broadcast several times with eccentric <laughs> outfits uh the mets are 10 and 3 since he's been shown i am pretty sure they've only lost one game while he's been in attendance and when i made a, a reel yesterday for instagram i declined to use that game because we have to push the narratives here right so danny do you think he has single-handedly changed the mets season yes um i believe in max i i really do like i'm not I'm not one for for cosmic intervention and all that stuff, but the vibes are immaculate. They're off the charts with this guy. Um, his outfits are on point, and I've heard him speak. I've I've looked at his backstory. He's a legit Mets fan. He's not out there just for the attention. I'm sure he likes the attention, but this is a legitimate Mets fan. He's a smart dude, and again, the the fur coats, the sunglasses, on point. Trevor, is this ever as a player? anything like some of these social media narratives that take over things that fans latch on to is that ever anything that that latches on with a team when you guys are playing well oh thousand percent like i don't i, I was i was gonna ask i'm like because I, I haven't seen it but are they gonna have like a fur coat they throw on guys after they homers like i i think we're like one <laughs> step away they should we notice this stuff we really really do I, i'll be honest i noticed it a lot too so it was a lot of times i was presenting to the to the class but uh like anything you can rally behind that that involves especially when it is connected to fans i think is the best thing ever in baseball when when that happens so i, I really hope they integrate some sort of uh something max related to some sort of celebration whether it's you know on if they're you know i we just saw a, a beta throw on the jacket maybe that's a fur coat i don't know a second maybe they do that I, or they have some pair of glasses there's all he gave them all kinds of ammo they can do whatever they want like uh, you could literally wear there. anything so and the, uh, i hope i hope they uh, adopt that and uh, he, he becomes part of the seat like the fabric of the season that's just those are the best stories and the mets haven't had you see a lot of teams have the celebrations the homer celebrations the mariners with the trident the orioles with their their hydration station system so the mets haven't had one of those this year so you know what they it's just what? the narrative is pushing itself let's go there's the uh technicolor dream coat the kramer war on seinfeld um yeah. for, for the Seinfeld fans out there maybe they can find that and uh put it in the dugout that's a great connection great right there. Ideas. love it that's a great idea. all right Charles, back to you all right Matt thanks so much I mean I'm all about the fur coat and the sunglasses my mom honestly might have one of those fur coats in her closet I have to talk to her about it maybe I can grab it from her um all right it's time now for a small sample size starting with Francisco Lindor struggling from the left side of the plate to start the season only five hits and 52 at bats with eight Ks. Uh, Trevor, you just did a breakdown of Julio Rodriguez's early season struggles on your podcast. And you, you played with Francisco Lindor for two years when he first got to New York. So what do you think is up with him? I, I think it's just, uh, there's a little bit of bad luck. Um, you know, the, the, what I look at when guys are really slumping, especially when like, there's no hits, is has anything changed in like the amount of swing and miss and the amount of like chasing outside of the zone different than anything they've been doing uh up to this point in their career and uh he doesn't have anything that's too glaring in those areas like he's not striking out at a crazy high rate or or anything he's still got tons of abs and he's still taking his at bats and generally looks like he's maintaining his approach when maybe pressing at times to get it going because that happens there's just like a little bit of that so i just think that this is uh uh an example of things not really going his way as much as he would like. And unfortunately, though, there has been some other guys, you know, Tyrone Taylor's been just red hot uh, guys picking it up in the lineup to to allow him to figure that out. And that's what good teams do. So in terms of timing, I honestly, there's no better time for him to struggle like this. And, uh, you know, he's the most consistent worker in person I've ever seen in, in the game. And so he is doing everything possible and it's just going to be a matter of he's going to there's going to be a week here where he just explodes and we're going to see we're going to see it generally the the stats shake out to Francisco Lindor uh you're going to you're going to he's going to be back he's going to be back and fortunately other guys are picking him up but when he comes back it's going to be special to see 
Yeah. Uh, Danny, do you think that the chairing, standing ovations, do you think that helped him? Does that kind of vibe with his personality? Uh, definitely couldn't have hurt. I mean, he spoke after that game and said that, you know, it, it filled his heart and it was, it was nice to see. And I wrote about it. Um, you know, it, it kind of built um, on Mets Twitter. There were a whole bunch of people saying that, let's try this. It worked for Trey Turner. Um, and I've always been someone who I see absolutely no reason to ever boo a guy unless it's for lack of effort or some kind of off the field transgression. Um, if you're booing him for any other reason, it makes no sense. They're out there. They're not trying to fail. Um, and especially Lindor, who's been a fantastic Met on the field, off the field. He was the ninth most valuable player in baseball last season via, via F war um, top 10 MVP. So yeah, I think it, I think it helped. Um, I would like to see uh, the fan base kind of act like that more often. Um, there's no, there's really no reason for toxicity. It's not going to help the team. It's not going to help get guys here. And I'm sure Trevor can speak about that. Um, if you see a toxic fan environment, people aren't going to want to play on your team um, for your franchise. So I definitely think it helped. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, all right, let's get to name that pitch. So Trevor, you were on Twitter saying all pitchers should name their pitches, calling your four seam the Homer helper, your change up the barrel buddy, otherwise known as Brian. Uh, who is Brian? I just picked the name. I just came to you. Okay, I, I, love, I love that. I love that. Um, okay, so we would like your help naming Jose Budo's change up. So take a look here. What do you think the name should be? Uh, then now we see, now you see me, now you don't like the John Cena, maybe John Cena. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. I like the John I Cena. I said da the Danny. Name before I said John Cena. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, what do you think? You got a name? I do. Um, but I have an aside first and I'm going to apologize to SMY's Jeff Goldman because I know he hates this movie. Um, but major league two, uh, Rick Vaughn named all of his pitches. So I just want to shout out Major League Two, which is not nearly as good as the first one, but it is watchable. Um, and for the name of the pitch, uh, I'm going to go with the Eliminator. Uh, it's been a really great strikeout pitch for him. So the Eliminator. John Cena and the Eliminator. I actually love both of those. And shout out to Jeff. I can't wait to get his reaction to you saying that after the show. Uh, okay, we do have another fan question. This comes from Chris Marion on YouTube. Chris says, Trevor, as a player, what question would you have liked to have been asked versus how do you feel after that win? So instead of someone asking you, how do you feel after that win? What question would you like to have been asked? Oh, that's, that's a great question. It's um, a good question. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird to answer that because whenever I heard that my, I would answer in like a bad, really bad. Like I, I would be very specific. I understand that the question isn't very specific. Um, I'll be honest. I really like that question. I, because I think it gives you space to like just be authentic about it and that uh, you're you're struggling with it just as much as they are. So yeah, I would I would say I want that one. I want that exact question. I like that question a lot. All right. Thank you, Chris. That was actually a really great question. Uh, okay. The Mets are headed out west, uh, Yamamoto versus Manaya on Friday. Trevor, why has Yamamoto struggled early on for the Dodgers? Why do you think that is? Um, I, I, there's, a, there's some acclimation. His command has not been very good. Uh, he's, he's leaving a lot. He's not getting to the corners of the plate very well. He looks like his mechanics are a little bit off time. Um, and that happens, but you know, he's got that kind of no leg kick thing going, which is hard enough to repeat. So I, I wonder if that has a little bit to do with it. Um, but then again, also he's 25 years old. Uh, you know, he's in a new country, and he just was given the biggest contract, like one of the biggest contracts ever. And he's a rookie to the league; he just got paid for. So there's going to be a level of pressure that very few people outside of maybe Jackson Holiday felt <laughs> recently. So it, it, I, there's part of it there, and and he he's one of those guys that if he just moves, gets gets his pitches more to the edges of the plate. And I know that's pretty pretty that's what everyone would say because he's an up and down he works up and down really well usually um but he needs to be able to to get strike one on the edge of the plate so guys need to think about in and out and uh, i don't think he's done that very well this year yeah uh danny who are you looking for to break out in la uh you know we just spoke a lot or trevor spoke a lot about francisco Lindor, and you know he has been unlucky uh his batting average on balls in play is crazy low uh compared to what it really should be um He's not making 
great contact uh, from the left side of the plate, but he has been very, very unlucky. And, you know, we've seen signs from him in the last week or so. He's starting to break out again, better from the right side than the left. Um, but I think this is the road trip where it happens for Francisco. He's, he's too good um, to keep struggling like this. So I'll say Lindor. All right, Francisco Lindor. Uh, okay, let's take a look at the Mets' upcoming schedule in more detail. The Dodgers, though, have lost three of their last four series. Uh, they have L.A., and then they take on the Giants, then they come back home. They will host the Cardinals and the Cubs. Uh, Danny, how do you think the Mets stack up with the powerhouse of the West? Um, I mean, look, no one really fully stacks up with the Dodgers. All right, they've got, they've got a super team. Um, they can win 110, 115 games. Um, no one's going to be surprised if that happens. So uh, they can clearly be beaten, though, uh, since they're just 12 and 9. Um, more imposing offensively right now than pitching wise. Um, they could get a serious jolt soon when Kershaw and May and Gonsolin come back. But fortunately for the Mets, those guys aren't back yet. Um, I'm not really sold on the Giants. Uh, I didn't have them making the playoffs in my preseason predictions that we did. Um, still not really sold on them. Blake Snell has started off really, really uh, tough. A um, couple, of, couple of poor starts out of the gate. Um, you know, obviously it would be great if the Mets won all six of these games, but I think three and three, four and two road trip uh, would be great. Trevor, is there anything that Mets fans should know about the Giants, the other team they're facing while on the West Coast? Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, the like, uh, you know, was just said i think a 4-2 uh record here is is would be a phenomenal road trip but i think it's very doable especially with how everything lines up um you know expect there to be a little bit of uh there there is a little bit of fatigue attached to the travel but fortunately we have an off day so that is something that in the past they haven't always had going to the west coast which is a positive so i think um you know just look how that first game pay attention to how that first game goes um and how tight the baseball is that is being played uh you know in the field and running the bases and if, if it's crisp from game one expected to be crisp for the whole whole uh road trip that's that's a general trend that that is uh pretty common uh when you when you're making that trip it's it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do in the world but uh fortunately they they ended up playing some really good baseball and able to make that uh, have a happy flight as we call it and uh so just yeah pay attention to how the first game goes and that'll set the tone for the rest of the trip Okay, as we wrap up here, um, how are you guys spending your off day? Trevor, starting with you. Well, my off day is uh, the same as most days. Uh, I, I, got a, I got some got some editing and some videos to make today. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the day after this. And I'm excited to do it. It's, uh, I Believe it or not, I do enjoy it. So uh, I, I'm, I get to that. do some fun work. Yeah. Love that. Danny, how about you? First, I'm going to finish working for SNY. And then once that is done... <laughs> I actually do have an answer. Um, so my wife, Priya, and I are going to finish signing up for our TSA pre-check. we got a couple of trips coming up, so we're going to go do that. Um, and I actually mentioned this question to her because I was thinking of what, what to say. And she was saying that she's craving Domino's and wants to order that tonight, um, which now that's usually reserved for something you order at 2 in the morning after a night out. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would judge you if I saw you getting Domino's before it's dark, maybe before it's 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. But... Um, if she really pushes hard, Domino's could be on our future tonight. <laughs> well, you know, what? I hope that she again. I hope she gets what she wants because that's what she deserves. So Domino's for your fam. I love that. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you all for watching our season two premiere of Mets Off Day Live. Our next episode will be Thursday, April 25th at 12 p.m. If you're looking for some baseball tonight, you can catch the Big and Tim Rumble Ponies on SNY at 7.30 p.m. Thank you for joining me, Trevor and Danny, and everyone enjoy the rest of your day.